You're listening to the preaching ministry of Redemption Bible Church in New Braunfels, Texas, where we are proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology. We pray that this message will be a blessing to you as you seek to worship Christ, walk with Christ, and work for Christ, all to the glory of God. For more information about our church, please visit redemption.bible. Thanks for listening, and we hope to see you soon at one of our upcoming worship services. Well, hey, good morning, church. My name is Blair. I'm one of the pastors here, and if uh, we've not had the opportunity to uh, meet, I would uh, love that opportunity. At the close of the service, I'll be out there, and uh, um, after we, we're going to be in God's Word together, and then uh, we'll have uh, a closing song and all that, but uh, uh, I'm just uh, thrilled to be here with you, worshiping God and uh, getting into His Word together. Uh, for those of you that were here on Friday night for our uh, prayer and worship and commitment night, wasn't that just a sweet time in, uh, uh, in God's presence uh, together, singing and praying together? Like that was just a, a sweet, sweet, sweet time. Another one of those moments in this whole uh, a journey that we're in, in building what lasts. So like you uh, heard in the announcement video, if uh, you need a Bible or one of these um, journey guides do, just uh, stick up your hand. Our ushers would love to get you uh, one because when you get your Bible, you're going to want to turn uh, to Psalm 112. And then in uh, your journey guide, you'll also uh, find your sermon notes or at least a section there under outrageous generosity right in the middle looks like this and there's some uh, in the pages that follow some uh, uh, daily prayer prompts and uh, some pulpit curriculum questions for you in your small group uh, uh, time together this week and even some family questions so on the way home today or around a meal this week you can engage your kids and uh, those in your household uh, in uh, uh, in the things that we're learning about and just going a little bit deeper. So make sure you have one of these and bring it back each and every week as we go. Now, again, if you're new with us, as you've uh, heard us say, you're here at a pivotal time in our church history as we plan for the future. And these are really exciting days for us as we follow the Lord in faith and building what lasts. And so as I've said each week, I just want to restate so we're clear on what this is all about. Building what lasts is uh, in this preaching series is a series in missiology of how God advances his purposes on earth through his people. Uh, we're exploring the scriptures together of how uh, God builds his church on the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and how God confronts the hindrances in our own heart, things like complacency and fear and idolatry to be part of something that will outlast us. And so we're exploring in this series just the landscape of our Bible in the various genres so that we can see these are things that God has always been up to in human in history. We started in week one in an Old Testament narrative there in Genesis 12 in the story of Abraham and Sarah's humble surrender to follow the Lord in faith. And last week we looked to the Proverbs to lead us in wisdom and how to completely trust the Lord when he is building something great. And today now we come to the Psalms and to one Psalm, to Psalm 112, to let the beauty of the lyrics lead our hearts now in building what lasts. And so hopefully you found uh, the book of Psalms. It's right there in the middle of your Bible. I just want to read the entire chapter. Uh, we're going to see the whole setting, but then we're going to actually just come to one of the gems that is in this, uh, this Psalm. And so have you found it in your Bible? Hopefully you have. Just listen here now as I read for us. Psalm 112. It begins this way. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. 
He is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Now, this is God's word for God's people this morning. And a a beautiful psalm. And really, uh, Psalm 112 pairs with the psalm prior to it. Psalm 111, where in the previous psalm, if we were to have read it, I preached it several years ago. But Psalm 111 is a description of the characteristics of the Lord, who He is, His person and work. And uh, flowing right out of it then, now in Psalm 112, is a description of then the man or the woman, the person who then... And fears the Lord, the character of those who fear God. And when we fear God, you will be then like him. You could say it this way. When we look at Jesus, you will live like Jesus. If you truly know him, then your life will look like him. And though not perfectly, obviously, as sin remains in us and we will until uh, we are with the Lord, uh, we uh, will be increasing and growing and maturing in these attributes or these fruits of righteousness that Psalm 112 lay out for us. And so we could just say this high level about what Psalm 112 is all about. You can write it down. It's here on the screen, but it's just simply this. Fearing God and delighting in His commands produce the fruit of righteousness. Okay, that's like what Psalm 112 is all about. Verse 1 is the controlling statement. The blessed man or woman is one who fears God and delights in God's commands. And when we do this, then these fruits of righteousness bear in our life. You're probably familiar with Galatians 5 and the, and the fruits of the Spirit. Have you encountered that in your walk with the Lord or in your Bible reading time? Hopefully you you have. We could uh, say something like this. That Psalm 112 then is an Old Testament fruits of the Spirit type chapter. All right. This, these are the fruits of the Spirit. When we're fearing God, when we're walking with Him, then these kind of traits or this fruit is what is the result in our life. Just like when we walk in the Spirit. Just like when we are controlled by the Spirit. When we are fearing God. When we are delighting in His commands, in His Word. Then traits of godliness bear out from our life. And, you know, we're not going to cover them all, but if we were to just glance over this entire chapter, we could highlight these things. You know, there's, as we uh, fear the Lord and delight in His commands, it's a blessing to our offspring. There's enduring wealth and righteousness, light, uh, grace, mercy, uh, righteousness, are, are fruits that come off, generosity and justice. There's a security and steadfastness. There unafraid you are are generous and honored and even uh, 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 attacked here or uh, have adversaries in your life these are the fruits here of a life that fears God and delights in his commandments. These are the things that bear fruit but like I said we're just today going to really uh, hone in on one trait The trait that is actually, interestingly enough, in the list of of what we've just drawn out here is mentioned three times in one form or fashion, this trait of generosity, this trait of financial management. That's clear. There's much more. If we were just going to preach this uh, psalm, there's much more to say here in these other traits, but it is not an accident that this is the one mentioned three times. Everything else except being unafraid, which is mentioned twice, everything else just uh, once really and so we want to hone in on generosity. And so if the, the overarching statement is fearing God and delighting in his commands produce the fruit of righteousness, then write this down as well. It flows from it then. Outrageous generosity is a fruit of righteousness. It's one of the fruits in this list that is born when we fear God and we delight in his commands. And so we're going we're gonna to focus in on this one today, but even most specifically for if we're going to hone in even closer when as it comes to our initiative, write this down as well. It takes outrageous generosity to build what lasts. It takes outrageous generosity to build what lasts. As God does his work in his people, as he has always done, it is marked by people fearing God and delighting in his commands with this fruit of generosity. We are to be generous. Why? Because God is generous. 
If you were to look at verse uh, 5 in the previous psalm, Psalm 111, God is the one who is generous. He is the one who gives. He is the one here. And so there's a biblical connection between our trust in the Lord, our knowing the Lord, and our generosity. We saw this also last week in Proverbs chapter 3. And so even as we are at this pivotal moment in the middle of this series, this is an opportunity for us. It's a teachable moment. One that, you know, we could go and maybe get, go to a foundation to fund these things or to get a loan, but it is really our opportunity as God's people, as he is doing something incredible amongst us to lean into and to bear this fruit of outrageous generosity. Now, I've made some claims here, so let's look to the scriptures to see it here in its setting here. Now, uh, Psalm 112 begins with this hallelujah or a praise the Lord. It's a call to worship. When you see this here, it's less of a vertical statement and more of a horizontal calling. Hey, everyone, let's praise the Lord together. And then, as I said, you have this description or the controlling statement about the blessed man or woman, the person who fears the Lord and delights in God's commands. And, and, and you know, this is really similar to what we saw in Proverbs. Now, fearing God and and, uh, delighting in God are not like these polar opposite emotions on the spectrum, right? I'd say, like, are we either scared of God or, uh, you know, or joyful in God? No, they work in tandem. It's actually, even though there's two things in view here, it is a singular action. As we fear God, we fear his displeasure. As we delight in his commands, it's because we are seeking God's pleasure, We're seeking his presence. And so as we turn to the Lord and away from sin, it is controlling us in such a way that we're saying no to sin and yes to righteousness. It's a singular action, a pursuit in knowing the Lord. And so how do we know if we're doing this? How do we know if we are indeed fearing God and delighting in his commandments? Well, it's if these fruits are born in your life, if generosity and righteousness and these other ones are fruit that are being born in such a way that are a lifestyle in your life. And this kind of church, like get this, this kind of generosity is so abnormal, it is outrageous. And as we see how the, uh, you know, the, the psalm ends in verse 10 and makes the world rage out against you. It's, out, it's outrageous. And so what is, the, what, what, what is this kind of outrageous generosity? Well, let's look at the three verses to discover just what is outrageous generosity. Write this down. It's a generosity that is a lifestyle, not an occurrence. Outrageous generosity is one that is a, a lifestyle, not merely an in, 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 in occurrence. Why? Because righteousness, godliness, is a lifestyle. It is not something that we do every once in a while. Our godliness, our faith, our righteousness is not just something that uh, is another department in our life, like our work and our family or anything else. It is over everything that we do, and thus these fruits... Like generosity is not merely like a one-time event. It's not merely an activity. It's not merely like an individual deed. Now, there are generous moments, no doubt. There are generous moments in our life, but biblical generosity is more than just a lifestyle. It is a heart posture in the same way that love or joy or peace or patience is something that is ready and settled in our hearts and so that we are willing and ready at all times times outrageous generosity is a lifestyle not merely an occurrence and this is really born out of what uh, the psalmist is getting at in verse 3 just look at it here wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever now this isn't a prosperity gospel statement all right one that like claiming hey if you're godly you will also be wealthy we, you know, we covered that a little bit last week. You can see why sometimes people get there when they see statements like this. But rather, it is a statement about what the righteous do with the wealth and the riches that have been entrusted to him or her. It's about what we do with what we steward. Because, see, the righteous have a view that is beyond themselves. Righteousness endures forever in the same way that uh, God's love endures forever. But the righteous have a view beyond their own wants and needs. And it affects how they live with their money. Wealth and riches, being in the house of the righteous is meant, it's not because it's to be hoarded, but actually to be given away and stewarded. 
I love what uh, Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher of the 1800s in London, what he says on this verse 3. Listen to this quote. He says this, Often when gold comes in, the gospel goes out. But not so with the blessed man. Prosperity does not destroy the holiness of his life or the humility of his heart. His character stands the test of examination, overcomes the temptations of wealth, survives the assaults of slander, outlives the afflictions of time, and endures the trial of the last great day. The righteousness of a true saint endures forever because it springs from the same root as the righteousness of God and is indeed the reflection of it. End quote. See, how the righteous, how we steward our money reflects the gra- our grasp of the gospel. And how we steward the great treasure that we sang about, that it's more than we deserve, more than we could hold. Uh, how do we, it, it, it's a reflection of how we understand the enduring love of God to us that was given fully and freely when we did not earn it nor deserve it. And, and see, this outrageous generosity is, is then the, the lifestyle. It's the story of our life because we understand that the gospel is an outrageous generosity story. Like that God would send his only son to save us is the supreme example of outrageous generosity, is it not? Right, the, 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 this truth here, why we have assurance of our faith today, why we believe that we will be with him in paradise. Do you believe that this morning, saints? It's a, it's a display of the outrageous generosity of God that we could have a hope that exists beyond today. This is the outrageous generosity to you who may not know Christ now who may still be skeptical, wondering, walking in, 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 the, in the deeds of your flesh, and now you're here this morning like, oh, of course, a preacher's talking about money. This is what he wants. I don't want your money. I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know the love of God that was poured out on the cross in, a, in, a, in the most outrageous display of generosity that would save you from yourself. That's what we want. That's, we want more and more to know that, that this would be built into your life, that you would be somebody who has a hope that lasts, a hope beyond your pocketbook, a hope beyond the political season, a hope beyond your job. The gospel story is a generosity story. It is something that we did not earn. And even as we understand it, it provokes the sneers even of the wicked as we want to understand what this means, like how, okay, how do we live this out in a lifestyle and to even ask good heart questions of ourselves, of is generosity a part of my lifestyle? I want to read a, a little bit of a lengthy but a penetrating uh, excerpt from uh, this book, Redeeming Money by Paul David Tripp. If you've ever read Paul David Tripp, you know that it's like, uh, it's just doing heart surgery every page, right? We have copies available out there if you want it. But this, listen to this, is what he says. He says, so much of the way sincere Christians look at money, finances, and budgeting seems to miss this gospel theology of generosity. Without this gospel theology of generosity, discussions of money become about how to steward what God has given you, how to keep out of debt, how to fulfill your contracted financial obligations, how to have financial stability, how to anticipate your financial needs upon retirement, and how to ensure that you give God a tithe. None of these things is wrong, and all of them are helpful in some way. But the whole plan is devoid of the larger considerations of the call to be God's ambassadors on earth. The normal plan is functionally devoid of gospel perspective and vision, and because it is, it focuses money and finances on personal need rather than on God's grand gospel agenda. And so we ask this question, could it be that when it comes to finances, we have the whole thing upside down? When we think of money, we tend to think of it as God's primary means of providing for us. And oh yes, he has called us to give. But could it be that scripture teaches that God's primary purpose for money is that we would be tools of his generosity mission on earth. And oh yes, he also uses it to daily provide for us. Now because God has taken the primary burden of provision off our shoulders and placed it on his own, we are free to have a grander vision for our money than just personal provision. 
Our Heavenly Father knows what we need and has promised to provide it. Therefore, by His generosity, we are free from financial self-focus and free to be part of His generosity mission on earth. God loves a cheerful giver because He is the ultimate cheerful giver. And whenever we live generously, we not only honor His generosity to us, but through our generosity, we point others to Him. As we just noted, God's goal for our financial life is that it would be driven by the grand call of his kingdom, not by personal need and provision. And when we reverse that order, we never end up celebrating God's generosity and committing to a generous life. If with our money we start with ourselves, we will never escape the endless needs, wants, and demands we place on our money. Our money will be dominated by self-focus and will try to somehow squeeze God into the plan. We will seek our welfare and hope uh, we have something left for his kingdom instead of seeking his kingdom and believing that as we do, he will faithfully provide. End quote. Isn't that so good? Isn't that just like, all right, like, Lord, like, okay, in the way that only Paul Tripp can write and do here. But see, like, get this, church, like, just as our righteousness Our favor, our salvation with God is not something that we have obtained with our own merit or our own spiritual discipline to earn God's favor. No, we did so by the, we received it by the grace and generosity of God. And so too is God pleased with our financial management, not just because of how like disciplined we are and how not in debt we are or whatever else, nor how much we have but with how willingly we give it away. And and church, the reality is this is something that we all have room to grow in, don't we? That we never arrive at this place of like, we've got this all figured out. In the same way that none of us arrives at this place of loving one another perfectly, but are always growing and improving and maturing and even multiplying in it. Because as Psalm 112 goes on, it shows us outrageous generosity is not only a a lifestyle, not just merely an occurrence. Write this down in verse 5. It teaches us this, that it's a generosity that leads to multiplied opportunities. But God takes it and multiplies the opportunities for the gospel, for uh, righteousness. Verse 5, it says this, it is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. It's a great statement. It, it, it is well. It will go well for you. Just like the, uh, the command to children to obey their parents, uh, and it will go well for you in the land. And again, it's not advocating a prosperity kind of gospel, right? Like everything will go my way when I give it all away. Not necessarily, but things do go well in our life when we are committed to a lifestyle of outrageous generosity that gives away in an upright or a just manner. Like, and I, I love this, right? Like the, the justice that is tied here, right? There's no shady deals in the getting of our money nor in the giving of our money. God wants us to do so in a way that is just or upright or honorable or in the light in both the getting of it and in the giving of it. And as we do, then we are looking for these opportunities to lend in a way that builds what lasts, in a way that furthers the mission, in a way that advances the kingdom as we deal generously and give away, right? The generous look for the opportunities, not just waiting for them to happen, but are ever eager. It is well with a man who deals this way, who deals generously and lends. Spurgeon also says about this that providence has made the man able to lend and grace makes him willing to lend. I love that. It goes well and we grow in this in our life. And maybe you're asking a question, okay, well, how, okay, I, I get it, Blair, I want to grow, I want this lifestyle, I, I, want to, uh, I, I, I want this to be something that is maturing in my life. So how do I go about it, Ron? It's like if you're asking God to grow you in patience, you say, God, grow my patience. He then gives us opportunities, right? He puts the uh, rock-tricent person in your life, you know, to be gracious and patience with us. But how do we then grow? Is it just like a disposition and some have it and some don't? 
is, uh, you know, something that we learn from others. You know, the whole nature versus nurture. I mean, maybe so. I don't know. Maybe it's a factor. But can we all agree that this is a trait like every other trait of godliness that we grow and mature in? Yeah. Yeah, we never arrived. The Pharisees are the ones who thought they arrived in their giving. They didn't have any place to grow or stretch or be challenged in this, but growing in faith means that we're growing in these same things. In the same way, like I said, that we grow in love and joy and peace and patience, we too grow in generosity. And all of us are being discipled and have steps to take in our maturity and our multiplication in this. That's why we've even said in this whole thing, we want 100% engagement in this. That's not just like, you know, like a, a nice spiritual thing to say, but, you know, really, we just want your, your money, right? Like, of course not. We really mean it. We all have a place to grow. Even our kids, that's why we're engaging them. We want them to experience the joy of generosity and just counter that impulse, that instinct that is in us because sin remains in us that everything is mine. But all of us have room to grow and experiencing the joy of outrageous generosity. And so what, is the, what does that look like, just real kind of practically? Well, that's where in the resource thing, and it's here on the, the screen, we uh, have just given you this, uh, this, this pathway, the generosity pathway, five steps, and a lifestyle of, of generosity. And as you've maybe read through that and thought through this, this is less focused on things like amounts and percentages, but rather on like our, our attitudes, our actions, and the way that God grows us in a lifestyle of stewardship and, and and sacrifice and generosity in this way, that in every step it is transforming us into the likeness of, of Christ. And for some in here, like the first step might just be coming an initial giver, like just in having a conversation now and just thinking for the very first time about, uh, about giving and just budgeting in, in general. And that part of our managing of the resources God has given us is something that we must take seriously. And now uh, for you, it's like, okay, I've seen it in God's word. Like this is everywhere. We saw it in numbers in multiple places. And now the, like the first step is actually giving a gift to the Lord. Praise God for this step, right? But it doesn't end here. It's like there's a maturing into then becoming a consistent giver. There are others of you maybe at the place of giving something on like a regular basis where now uh, uh, that you're budgeting, you're thinking of, okay, this is now a line item on the spreadsheet in the same way that you uh, steward the other uh, resources or you pay out other things and you set it up uh, in a consistent way so that you don't forget it, whether you come to church or not, whether you're you know, uh, in a season of want or in plenty. And the next step is just, you know, maybe it's setting up an online recurring giving in this way or setting a reminder on your phone so you don't forget to bring your check and it's just growing in this way of being consistent and you know I'm afraid sometimes in our Christian walk like we get to this place and then we think okay I've arrived I've got it right I'm disciplined now I, I and, and and yet we can stall out in our growth here and God still has a room to mature and to multiply us into this and to a place of uh, intentional giving where now it's not only the consistency of it, but where you're starting to ask the heart questions of, of how giving is in relation to the other things that you spend money on. Like, why am I giving AT&T more money than I give to the Lord? For all, you know, phone and everything else here. You know, why, 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 why am I giving to, you know, my, my trainer and supplements and all these things? Like, why am I contributing more to my physical health than my spiritual health? And we're starting to just think intentionally here where the consideration maybe is a percentage and, you know, where it's, okay, now I'm shooting for a 10%. But even that, we can't view that as like, oh, right, here's the point of arrival or here's the, the ceiling. But now there's just an intentionality of seeing like, okay, how do I view my resources and my giving as a reflection of my view of God and my commitment to his mission? There's a good heart work here that God is, is doing to where there's now like the next step is, you know what, I want to set a, a goal for a, an amount or a percentage or something that uh, as I seek the Lord that he's challenging uh, me too. And yet even here, there's still increase. There's still um, room for maturing in the faith to surrendered kind of giving. 
to where here it's like, you know what, where there's a recognition of the cost that Jesus paid on the cross and, and, and this saying like, you know what, I know that 100% of what I have belongs to the Lord. And so I want to begin to give in a way that changes me, where there's a switch now in our thinking about our financial management, where now giving governs my spending and my saving rather than my spending and saving governing my giving. And what we're putting away and what we're saving for later. It isn't, you know, the, where the consideration here isn't necessarily what I am giving, but rather what I'm not giving and why. What is this saying? How am I prioritizing the future in a way that's saying, you know what? I want everything that I have, whether I'm uh, holding on to them later and allocating these things to the kingdom. Even so, even in our growth, even in this pathway, there's so like in all areas of righteousness, there's even multiplication, a multiplication mindset and a generosity in things like legacy giving. Or some may be at the place in life who is actually thinking now about the long-term effects of our generosity that will outlast our life. Uh, it's less of a consideration of a month to month. Am I going to make it to the end and am I, uh, of the month and still have you know, food to eat or even beyond year to year type generosity? But now a legacy kind of giving thinks in the uh, rather like short term decisions and thinking of longer term effects. And now it becomes like a lifetime goal of how much if uh, the Lord should tarry, how much do I want to allocate in my life for the kingdom, for the mission? And, it, and this now begins to govern larger purchases like homes and other second homes and cars and investments and these things. And so the step here is like, what do I want? Like, what do I want my lifetime goal? What do I want my legacy of generosity to be? How much can I give away in my entire life? And this, this, you know, this is just pretty simple here. It's not like these are the only five things. And if you reach the place of legacy, then you're, then you're done. There's always room to continue maturing and multiplying in such a way that leads to these opportunities in our life and for the gospel. And so let me just reiterate something here. Each of these steps is important. No one step is more important than the other. Every step matters as we remember what Jesus has done for us. As we grow in our faith and each step is leading, like I said, to opportunity. It's our opportunity, no matter where we are, and thinking through these things is our opportunity to grow in humble surrender and complete trust in the Lord as we take steps of, of just offering to the Lord. And he then takes our two loaves and two fish, or two loaves and five fish, rather, and he creates opportunities to grow others, to expand his kingdom, to plant churches. You know, as we look to build out and increase our ministry impact, as we look to build on and raise up other planters to plant uh, churches here. And only heaven will know the full impact of the outrageous generosity and the opportunities that God gives us, uh, both in, in this whole opportunity and for the rest of our lives. Like there's something much bigger than even this small initiative that God is doing in each of our lives and in this church that will far outlast us. But that's outrageous generosity. It's, uh, it's leading to, these, to this maturity. It's leading to multiplied opportunities in our life. And the crazy part is in God's undeserving grace, as we uh, follow him obediently in this and joyfully and willingly, we receive honor for it. Like outrageous generosity, write this down, is a generosity that leads to both honor and outrage. It's interesting like how uh, this psalm culminates here. Three times it's talking about finances and how we uh, uh, deal with them. And, and at the end, he just says this. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. But the wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Like, now, no church, like grasp how incredible this is as, as we kind of come to a close here. He's, the psalmist has been painting this picture in verses 6 through 8 of this resolute, fearless, steadfast heart of the righteous that then culminates again in outrageous generosity. Did you see that? 
And verse 6, 7, and 8, that's a whole nother uh, series. That's a whole nother like sermon uh, on of just being unafraid and steadfast and not, not fearing bad news that comes in, right? right? There's like a therapist call this being differentiated. Of, you know, where your attitude and your behaviors aren't affected by the people, circumstances, and attitudes around you. Okay, where you are, you are able to differentiate between the, you know, the immaturities or the other things here. The Bible just calls that being steady, of being steadfast, unafraid of bad news here, right? And this is very appropriate, actually, as it's kind of flowing here. Like, 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 like just listen for a, a second. Like, to be real practical, like, who is elected in November could affect our pocketbooks, but it should not affect our generosity. Like, it, we all are feeling the effects of inflation, aren't we? We're all feeling it, and it's like, you know, what it, whoever wins, you know, in November, whether you think that is bad news or great news for the nation, right? Like, it can affect our generosity. We're not afraid of these things. God is, uh, is bigger than any, uh, you know, any politician. And so while it may have an effect, while it's not just something that we just dismiss altogether, our heart can be steady. We do not need to be afraid. We can continue to live a life in full force for the mission of God's kingdom. It's building what lasts in a way that challenges us and puts our trust in the Lord, right? We don't need to fear getting that email. We don't need to fear losing that big client. It could happen, no doubt. But we fear the Lord, not bad news. And when we do, we can live generously and distribute and give away freely to the Lord's purposes. And he builds what lasts through it. And lest you think here, lest you think like we're like the only believers God has ever called to do this, it is across the pages of Scripture. We heard that even in our, the testimony video earlier alluding to that, the early church committing to this. And if they were people afraid of bad news, if they were people fearing the government, it was them, right? But it's not just even in the early church. Even all the way back into our Old Testament, from Exodus to Numbers to 1 Chronicles and the book of Acts, you have these examples of believers, of people following the Lord who are giving generously to building what lasts. And when God is doing something great, He does so through acts of outrageous generosity. Like just, I'm going to put them on this screen here. We're going to just go through it so you can see. Like this is what, <laughs> this, is, this is really true here, right? The pattern throughout it. When they're building the tabernacle, Exodus 35, 4 and 5, Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze. When Israel had been freed from their Egyptian slavery, here in Exodus 35, I preached it years ago, you can go listen to the message on it. The people now give to the Lord when they have no hope for anything coming beyond it. Only they're trusting God in faith, and now they're bringing to the building of the tabernacle. But not only there, we saw this a few months ago in Numbers chapter 7, and the consecration of the tabernacle. Now it's being built. The priests have been uh, assigned. And he says to this, Accept these from them that they may be used in the service of the tent of meeting, and give them to the Levites, to each man according to his service. Every tribe, 100%, giving to the consecration, coming, each of them coming forward forward to offer their contribution. Now what's crazy too, that's at the setting up of the tabernacle, the tent as they are mobile. But when they go from being mobile to building a, a permanent location, a permanent place at the temple, in 1 Chronicles 29, you have this pattern of first, starting with King David to then the leaders and then uh, all the people. Listen to these verses here. Here's the first that King David contributes. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver. And because of the devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. So we're giving it all, but it doesn't stop there. The leaders, verse 6, then the leaders of the Father's house made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes and the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and of the officers over the king's work. And then the people respond in verse 9. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly not under compulsion, not being coerced, for with the whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. 
Now here they are, they're giving their, uh, with an outrageous generosity in a way that they're being honored and remembered even now. That's the Old Testament in the New Testament. Here we go. Are you, are you still along for the ride with me? I want you to just see it here. You can go back and look at these uh, passages later. Write down the references. Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit has come. Thousands have been saved. The, the disciples are devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, the prayers, and the fellowship. And it says this. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all. As any had need, and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved it is out of this fruit of generosity now God is continuing to multiply the work in the early church so much so even two chapters later thus Joseph who is also called by the apostles uh, Barnabas which means son of encouragement a Levite, a native of Cyprus, he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Here's a man sacrificially giving, selling something so that the gospel would go forward. But it wasn't just an early church thing. Decades later, after the apostle Paul is saved and is now planting churches, he's planted one in Ephesus. Ephesus, the church that later would be, reminded, hey, return to your first love. Paul would say this to the elders there, in all things... Yeah, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is just, you know, we covered a lot of ground there, but this is just a small sampling even of all the moments across the scripture of outrageous generosity, about honoring them and remembering them that also brought outrage from those who hated the gospel but I wonder this, how much do we, uh, you know, we love the feeling of joy that we get on paydays, but how often do we miss out on the greater joy of giving away? You know, when we fear the Lord and delight in his commands, then there's honor. Our horn is exalted, not in a way so that we can boast, right? That's not what this is talking about. Like, hey, look how much I give. And no, like, no, it's like, because God gives, I can give. I can commit to this and God will do something great and has provided for their needs every step of the way. Get this, get this. The Lord exalts us, not for what we have, but for what we give away. This is, see, this is the gospel pathway for exaltation. Before Jesus was exalted at his resurrection, what did he have to do? Give away his life. And what we've said is the most supreme act of outrageous generosity. This is the gospel pathway to honor and exaltation. It is death. It is giving away. It's outrageous. In such a way, you know, that the wicked hate it. They see this kind of outrageous sacrifice. They hated Christ's sacrifice. And some may think you are crazy for giving away generously. Your financial planner may think you are out of your mind. Your family members may be gnashing their teeth. But if the Lord is pleased, that's all that matters. If the Lord is pleased, that's all that matters. This is what fearing God and delighting in his commands is all about. And it leads to building what lasts. That's what it's all about. Right? Fearing God and delighting his man's produce the fruit of righteousness. Outrageous generosity is a fruit of righteousness. And it will take outrageous generosity to build what lasts. A generosity that is so abnormal, it is outrageous to the glory of God. Would you pray with me, church? And as I do, I want to lead us in, uh, I'm just going to recite a, Prayer from every moment, holy. Bow your heads and let me just pray in this way. O God, in truth, I have nothing but you. O Christ, nothing that I might call my own. So let that good confession now compel a better stewardship. First, Lord, teach us to treasure you, to treasure you, Jesus, above all things then let that increasing devotion be increasingly demonstrated in a joyful generosity. 
For to give is to live out the declaration that you alone are my provision and supply. We need not fear what comes tomorrow. Lord, let me make each offering without thought of temporal gain. Let me give precisely because I have believed your promises are true. And let my giving be the proof. If you are my shepherd, then I am freed to live generously, knowing that I will never want for any needful thing. Knowing that any seeming deprivation is but the work of your spirit, weaning me from a world of things and winning me to greater dependence upon Christ my King. So why should I grasp but the thing which I cannot keep? This body will sleep in death and what I now hold so briefly will pass into the keeping of another. I own nothing here, I have no claim. Dispel the myth of my possessions, lest they taint that better hope of heaven. Rather, let me learn while I draw breath to live with open hands and joy-filled heart, investing your resources in your good works. Let me plant these mortal seeds in expectation of immortal harvests. We pray these now in Christ's name.